All right, so today we're going to look at um, imperfect people in God's perfect plan. Uh, Miriam, when she called about the bulletin, I was actually at Cedar Point with the youth group, and uh, I gave her the title, and at first she misheard it and heard 10 perfect people in God's perfect plan, which that would have totally changed my message and been very difficult to do. Fortunately, imperfect people are a lot easier to find because we only know there's only one perfect person. Um, all right, so this fall, uh, my daughter is going to be a senior at South Lane, South Lane East High School. And during her time there, she has been involved in theater. They typically do a play in the fall and they do a musical in the spring. And so with everyone, the same thing happens. They audition. Then that night, an email goes out from the director saying, this is who's made what roles. And so two things from that happen. One, there's either happiness or sadness. We've been very blessed that we've had six for six on happiness. But then the other thing that happens is I'll hear about the feedback of like, well, why did this person get that role? It should have been this person. Or why did they get that role? Now, to their credit, and to hers also, the performance then happens, and afterwards she says, no, that was the right person for the role. That, that did right. You know, that is the right person. But I feel like the same thing happens with God. We, we look in the Bible or in people in life, and we say, why that person? Why did God use that person? That's, that's not who I would pick. That's not who we would have used. And so what we're going to do today is we're, we're going to look at three of those imperfect people in the Bible. So we're going to start in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you some context. Israel has left Egypt, and they have been wandering 40 years, and it is time for them to take over the Promised Land. They have already conquered one side of the Jordan, and they are planning to go across the Jordan and start conquering over there. And so Joshua sends two spies to check out. The first city they're going to hit is Jericho. I think this is very familiar, but I'm still going to give you the context. They send two spies to Jericho. And we read in Joshua 2.1, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went, and they came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. Now, in history, there have been people that have titles that are credit to the people they are, right? Alexander the Great, Richard the Lionheart, you know, the unsinkable Molly Brown, if you want to go more recent, right? What you're going to see is we have Rahab here. And whenever she's referred, she is Rahab the prostitute, right? Not exactly a credible, credibility building title to have. You know, we know exactly what she was, right? She's Rahab the prostitute. And one thing we note here is, you know, so the spies come and it says, um, and what we know from 215 is her house was built into the wall. She lived in the wall. And so the spies come and they stay with her and she hides them. And before she hides them, she says, hey, we want you to know that we've heard about you guys, <laughs> and we're scared. We know what you've done already, but specifically what I want to know is what she says in, chapter, in verse 11, chapter 2. She says, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. 
You see that? Rahab the prostitute refers to the God of Israel, a different nation, as Lord, right? For the Lord, your God, is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And she recognized who this God is. And so she said, please protect me, right? Protect me and my family. And they said, okay, you hang a cord out your window, and as long as everyone's in your house, we will keep you safe. We promise you your life for ours. And so, mind you, when this all happens, Israel hasn't even crossed the Jordan. There's a big old river between the people, you know, which is a credit again to Rahab, right? She knew they were coming no matter what. And so... Anyone that's been in Sunday, spent any time in Sunday school knows the story, right? Israel comes over. They march around Jericho six days. Then on the seventh day, they march around again. And they make a great noise and shout. And God causes what to happen? The walls come tumbling down, right? But there's one thing, right? Did all the walls come tumbling down? No. Rahab lived in the wall. God preserved her part of the wall. And then, and then Joshua directs the spies, hey, go get Rahab and her family. And so Rahab and her family were spared. And it says, oh, Rahab lived with them um, from that point on. So her faithfulness and understanding and trusting those spies and knowing that that was God preserved her family. But that's not all. That's not the last we hear of Rahab the prostitute. Three times in the New Testament is she mentioned. The first one we're going to look at is Matthew 1, where there's a genealogy given. Okay? And you read, and it starts with um, Abraham, and it's working down, and it says... Um, Nation and nation, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And that occurred to me till this morning, but do you think Boaz's mother might have had a little impact on Boaz's openness to a Gentile woman and God working in a Gentile woman? So Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king, which makes Rahab, the prostitute, the great-great-grandma of a king. God used Rahab, the prostitute, in this line that led to the king of David. Then you read, in Hebrews 11, there is given a list, an example of people known for their faith. People mentioned that include Enoch, who didn't know death. God just took him up. Abraham, right? Joseph, we know Joseph, enslaved in Egypt. Moses, and then in verse 31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. You have like titans of faith to that point. And in that, the writer of Hebrews, who we many believe to be Paul, uses Rahab the prostitute. And then in James 2, James writes, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, 
so also, also faith apart from works is dead. So here James is giving an example of how faith and works need to work one together. Now, when we got the example of faith, we got the number of people listed, right? James gives one example. James uses Rahab the prostitute as an example of someone who through their works showed their faith. So, we talked about grandma, great, great grandma of a king, and that's where we're going to pick it up. Because next we're going to look at David. What do we know about David? Well, he was a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14. This is actually before David becomes king. Saul is king. He's disobeyed God. Um, Samuel is bringing him a message and says, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. All right, what you got to know is when Saul was picked up, they're like, hey, this is someone that we all looked at and be like, yep, that's the man. But God says, tells us, you know, I look at man's heart. And David was a man after God's own heart. And he even promised David. He said, in 2 Samuel 7, 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established before forever. So here's David, a man after God's own heart, that God says, I am going to establish your kingdom forever. And David was a great king. Conquered many lands, right? Very strong. Lots of success. Wrote tons of psalms, right? Very well. Great example. But then we read 2 Samuel 11, 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It's a very ominous last part. Because what this, this starts with, in the spring of the year when Kings go out to battle, David remained back. Uh-oh, that, that's already the start in trouble. And so what do we read then? What happens? David is at home. He's on top of his palace. He looks down and he sees a beautiful woman. Mind you, David already has several wives at this point. He sees a beautiful woman. He inquires about her. And they say, that is Bathsheba, wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, mind you, Uriah was a soldier, but he wasn't just any soldier. They list what David had, what's called 30 mighty men. Uriah was one of them, right? But David disregards that. And he then lays with Bathsheba. So he commits adultery. David, the man after God's own heart, commits adultery. And then he makes the problem even worse. Because she gets pregnant. And she's like, hey, I'm pregnant. And he's like, okay, we're going to cover this up. Uriah, come back and lay with your wife. And my hope is that if you do that, then it'll look like it's your kid, right? But Uriah is an honorable man. And he says, nope. He doesn't, he doesn't, mind you, David didn't say that with specific words to him. I'm interpreting. David just said, hey, Take, relax, go see your wife, you know? But his ulterior motives, thank you. Um, ulterior notes. But Uriah's like, no, I can't, I can't, you know, the rest of my, my brothers are out there sleeping in, out in fields and stuff. How can I do that, you know? And he refuses. So that doesn't happen. And David sends him out to war and tells Joab, his commander, put him where it's fiercest fighting so that he will be killed. And that's exactly what happens. So he puts him up. Uriah the Hittite is killed. And so then David, after a proper time's mourning, then takes Bathsheba as his wife. And so you have the case of adultery and then murder. Right? 
The man after God's own heart saw a woman commit adultery and had her husband killed. Nathan confronts him. And David admits, he, he gets confronted, he admits he's sinned. And he, he's fasting, the baby is sick, and God takes that baby away. That was, and Nathan had warned him, that would be. Um, and so David, what does he do when the baby passes? He gets himself dressed, and he goes and worships the Lord. You know, he repented of his sin, and he worshiped the Lord, and then that's where we pick it up in 2 Samuel 12, 24. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. I found that interesting, this little part, right? And the Lord loved him. The Lord loved Solomon. And mind you, as I said, at this point, David had eight wives. Out of those eight wives, he had 19 sons. Out of all those sons, Solomon is the one that became king. My money would have been on Abigail. But God's pick was Solomon, who was born out of an affair, right? He was that son. But that's who God chose to use. And we all know how Solomon did. Wisest man. I touched on him a couple sermons ago. Um, And then we also see, going back to Matthew 1, right? And, you know, Jesse the father of David and David the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. So they even note it right there, right? And Solomon the father of Rehoboam and so on and so on until we get to Jesus. So the line, the human genealogy line of Jesus included uh, Rahab the prostitute and then a child that was born based out of an affair and murder, right? But that is who God chose to use. So that then leads us to our third one. Um, Now that we've reached down to the genealogy of Jesus, it is not Jesus by any means, right? Jesus is perfect, but we're going to get to the end of Jesus' life and... Jesus is being crucified. And he is put with two thieves or criminals. Um, in fact, Jesus was put in between them. So one on his left, one on his right. He's down the center. And in Isaiah, it was, you know, prophesied that the Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors. So this, in essence, symbolizes it because he's right there in the middle with them. And, and you read that in Matthew, Matthew 27... Uh, 44, Mark also notice, notes this as Jesus is up on the cross and, you know, the religious leaders are mocking him, like saying things like, hey, you know, he saved others, why can't he save himself? And we read in Matthew 27, 44, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So leaders are mocking him, people are mocking him, and these other thieves who are facing the same judgment he is, are mocking him. But then what we find is, it appears one of them has a change of heart. You read in Luke 23, 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today 
you will be with me in paradise. So, here we have a criminal, and that's been his whole life, right? And, and the fact that we see he reviled him at first doesn't give any indication that he really knew Jesus beforehand or was any kind of believer, right? He was already reviling him. But then he has that God works on his heart, right? And you see that first he shows repentance by recognizing that he was being justly punished, right? He says, hey, what we've done, this deserves this. And we don't know exactly what they did, but he, he was admitting, right? He repents. And then he says, you know, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah, as the king. He has that faith that Jesus... Um, that Jesus would rise and rule, right? Because right now, is there any indication? No, Jesus is on the cross just like him. But he recognized that Jesus would rise and rule. And then, Jesus, he says, hey, just remember me. He's not even looking to get in, right? He's like, just remember me when you're up there. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, so where does the thief play into God's plan? You know, we kind of saw with Rahab the prostitute and with David, he, you know, the, there's the line of Jesus. Um, I think it, it's kind of what his conversion symbolizes. Uh, two things I want to call in particular. One of the greatest lies Satan has convinced mankind of is that we can or must earn our way into heaven. Right? Acts based faith. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 tells us that's not true, right? It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, of this not your own doing, is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, but yet we still think, people still believe, right? Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 tells us it. The criminal on the cross proves it. He is literally on the cross at that point. His hands are nailed or tied or however they did it. There is nothing else he can do. He can't, he can't do good works at that point. He can't give money to a cause. Heck, he can't even be baptized. Right? We, we say that salvation is by faith alone, Baptism is not obedience, it's done out of obedience. It's not baptism that saves. He proves that, right? Because he is on the cross. There is nothing else he can do than to repent and have faith and believe. Right? And that is what he does. The second thing I, I kind of know is, um, you know, by a show of hands, um, how many of you have people in your lives? who you love very much, who have never shown an interest in believing in the God of the Bible. Everyone has someone like that, right? The th criminal gives us hope, doesn't it? Gives us hope that up until the last moment, God can change a heart. And he did that with the criminal. So, we have looked at three imperfect people of the Bible. Well, guess what? We are all imperfect people. This sanctuary is filled with imperfect people. Me chief among them. Romans 3.23, that's why I picked it as the verse that Russ read. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you may be like Rahab, the prostitute. Not that it was prostitution, but you have spent your way, your life, away from God. Right? Your path hasn't been walking with him. Or you might be like David. Right? Someone who faithfully sought God their whole life. 
All right, a lot of us, they're going to church our whole life. But then they make a mistake. Right? I'll tell you, you can't be like the thief on the cross because you're here today. So you're hearing the truth right now. It's not a last man thing, and you're accountable to that. But we do have that hope for our other people. But we could be any of one of these people. They were all imperfect. But they are also people who were repentant and had faith. Luke 15, 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In Acts 10, 21. Testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The mistakes you make or have made do not discount you from being a part of God's bigger plan. I want to say again, the mistakes you make or have made do not discount you from being part of God's bigger plan. The three people we look at are proof of that. We serve a forgiving God. Psalm 103.12, as far as the east, I have my directions right, is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We serve a forgiving God from east to west who also has a plan we cannot understand. Ephesians 1, 9 through 10, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The mystery of his will, his purpose, his plan. And so not only does he forgive our mistakes, but God can turn our mistakes into blessings, can he? He did that with David. Right? I mentioned that. 19 sons, he chose Solomon. Right? The one that came out of the affair. Because even when we mess up, God can work with that. God can work all things to his perfect plan. And then the last thing is you never know what God may do in your life or in the life of those in the generations that come after you. Right? We saw that too. Rahab the prostitute and this David, right? Jesus came out of that line. Others came out of line. You have, there's no saying what God will do, but first you've got to take that step, right? That faith and repentance. Set that standard, and then God can bless those generations that come after you. We serve a very loving and perfect and forgiving God. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We come to you as imperfect people, Lord. We come to you as sinners, but Lord, you love us, you forgive us, and you've sent your perfect son for us imperfect people, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that if there's a person who has not repented and has not believed that they will, Lord, and I pray for those that have, Lord, but that if they stumble, they may remember that. You can never stumble too far from you, Lord. And that they'll know that they can return to you. We thank you for that perfect love you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.